On the podcast today, I have legendary photographer Corbin Gherkin. Corbin has been such an icon for me. I remember when I was getting started, Corbin needed a second shooter, of course, in Lake Como, Italy. I cannot tell you how fast I messaged her and begged her to let me come and shoot with her. I had had a pretty good business at that point. I was established. I was making good money, but I knew working with Corbin would be something that I could learn endlessly from, and I was not wrong. We landed in Lake Como, and from the first moment, seeing how Corbin walked through the venue, seeing how she addressed the couple, seeing how she tackled the couple's portraits to the ceremony, to the reception, how gracious she was, how easily she handled everything that was thrown at her. I remember we had to like rush and do the cake cutting and the way Corbin lit it and moved her camera, and she shot it on a tripod, and she could shoot so genius on a tripod, you guys, because she was composing within her grid and her perfection of photos is just so, so inspiring to me. It truly helped me up my flat lake game. It helped me realize just how much more I could be giving to my couples, how to interact with them better. So I have been wanting Corbin on the podcast since it first started, and we have her here today. I'm going to dive into all the questions I have for her. (laughs) You guys send him more because I want to have Corbin back as a guest very, very soon because this episode, I could have kept going and going and going from her pricing structure to her gear to her flat lays. We dive into it all and we even tackle what it was like to shoot Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner's wedding and what that meant for her career. That's right. We've got celebrity photographer Corbin Gherkin on the Play It Brave podcast today. You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real-world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand-holding or fist bumps, so stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. Corbin, I am so excited to have you on the Play It Brave podcast. It is your first time. We've met each other once in person, but now you're here on the podcast. It feels complete. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy to be here. This is my first podcast. Woohoo! Okay, I love it. Well, I've got lots of questions for you. People want to know you. One of the reasons I think you have such a great reputation is that you really do just stick to the work and you're very dedicated to your work. I look at the way you compose your shots, the way that you capture a moment. And to me, it just speaks to like this perfection, but like a healthy perfection. You know, sometimes we can say perfectionism and it's like yeah. bad, but to yeah. me, it's like, it makes me just want to take a breath and enjoy it. Like, I can't tell you your flat lays are so soothing to me. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So let's just dive right into some of this stuff. How did you get started in photography? You've been shooting for 19 years, even though I told Uh, her she was 25. So (laughs) I'll take it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a funny story. I, I, so I was always the art kid, absolutely, in mm-hmm. school and always really into painting and drawing. So I came into photography definitely already with an interest in the arts. Um, but I got a high school job working for a photographer who photographed gift wrap and uh holiday nut catalogs. So like the type that you would go around, uh, you know, children would go door to door. I'm sure they don't do this anymore. It's totally a liability. But, um, (laughs) but when I was in, uh, when I was in middle school and in high school, you would get these catalogs and then you would go, you know, door to door selling them. And so I worked for a photographer um, who photographed those catalogs and I would go after school you know, learn a little bit about the lighting process. And it was very specific in terms of the lighting that they did. And um, I wasn't interested in this at all. (laughs) Like, I mean, as a photographic thing, it just, it was much more of a technical experience, but Mm -hmm. I, and I had met him through a local camera shop. He had a picture of himself with a Hasselblad on his business card. And I was excited about, you know, shooting medium format film. And, um, but I quickly realized that that world of 
catalogs was not for me. And Mm -hmm. I actually ended up getting introduced to a wedding photographer in town when my mom of all people went with a friend whose daughter was getting married to look at this person's portfolio. And she was just so impressed by this photographer. Um, She was, her name is Deborah Triplett. She's fantastic. Um, She was someone who really towed the line between fashion photography and wedding photography at a time when that really wasn't the style. It's not what people were doing. It was Mm -hmm. much more photojournalistic back then. Um, A lot of sort of black and white reportage type stuff. But I just loved her work and I soaked up every minute of this. So, so I actually ended up getting a job with her. Um, yeah. Was that before or after you spent time in Italy? Um, that was before. So I was in high school when I got a job with Deborah and I just loved shooting weddings. So I would assist her, but then it became apparent that like, maybe I could do this. And she ended up, um, she kept on hiring me for weddings when I was in college. So I went uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina, I went to NYU, um, to Tisch for photography. And I just kept on shooting weddings throughout my time there. So Deborah would get clients in New York and she would book me sort of like as an associate photographer. Um, and so I just kept it going from there. Yeah. I think a lot of people like look at your Instagram now, look at all you've accomplished. And I don't think they realize the years that you've put in. You could, to a lot of us who just (laughs) maybe new people who just discover you, just seem really lucky. You know, you're photographing Jonas Brother weddings in the south of France and, you know, Glenn Close's family in, in, on the, on the East coast. And I think people don't realize like you knew from a young age that you wanted to be artistic. You got exposure to photography really early. And then you went to NYU. You and I share that. I went to NYU for directing. Nice. You went for photography. What was some of the things that you felt New York and NYU and that campus, you know, that's built just into the city. Yeah. How did that affect what your goals were? Did it give you a lot of ambition or, or where? where it did, you- did. I mean, I will say I, I went to college at a very interesting, difficult time for New York. So I was a freshman. My first day, my first official day of my freshman year was September 11th, 2001. And I was on my way to school, on my way to class um, when the planes hit the Twin Towers. And, you know, that was such a difficult time for New York, but it was also a really informative experience living in the city during that moment because everything became connected to, really everything was sort of connected to September 11th. So, so much of my um, college experience was the aftermath of that event, the healing process for a city. Um, you know, there was, a, there were a lot of visual things happening. Artists were making work all around, you know, that topic. And so I think I was very much focused on that. Um, there were a lot of those themes kind of going into my work and, I did love weddings and it was a nice reprieve, but I I wasn't on a wedding photographer track because it just, I don't know that that would have been accepted or encouraged by a fine art department who's trying to churn out, you know, photographers, artists who are showing in galleries. It's not that they wouldn't have supported me making money or pursuing a career that I loved, but I think that they just were encouraging other things. So I was, I was focused on some fine art. I did a lot of portraiture driven courses at NYU. Um, but by the end of college, um, and I, and I did do a study abroad in Italy and we could, we can talk about that because I do have such a connection to Italy and, Mm -hmm. and that certainly informed my career later. But, um, yeah, by the, by the time I graduated college, I had decided that I wanted to be a war photographer and a war a war photographer. Yeah. And so National Geographic, get in there, journalism, get in the trenches. Yeah. That was the time to do it though. There was, you know, it was before iPhones. It was before all of that technology that now makes, you know, now when a country is going through a crisis, 
everyone's like the Your photographer. There. Yeah, um, yeah. But I had that desire too. I was like, I want to go into these countries and tell the stories that yeah. are not being able to be told. And yeah. I don't know if you were moved by this too, but just those images that one image that de- depicts the depression or that depicts yeah. a war or depicts something. And it's just like those images still stay with us again and again and again. Yeah. I, th- I think I definitely felt that. Um, I-, I loved the, I loved the story, you know, going through kind of the elements of a story where you would find, um, you know, like you'd find an overview scenic shot and then you'd get a, an emotional portrait. You may get a close up on someone's hands. There were, I loved that aspect of the narrative. Um, And it's funny because it's something I absolutely pursue in my wedding work. Um, But at the time, I think I just thought, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with this photography degree. And I did take it as far as um, that summer after my senior year, I went to Kosovo for an assignment um, and photographed there. I stayed in Kosovo and Pristina for about six weeks, I guess it was. And I met some incredible people there. Um, I sort of pursuing photojournalism and was really blown away by the work that they were making there. Um, there was one guy who had worked with Nakwe while he was there. And um, so I was really moved by that experience. And then from there, I was trying to pivot a little bit into photographing for nonprofits. So mm-hmm. I ended up, um, going from Kosovo to a workshop in Uganda. Um, And that's actually where I met my husband. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so I was shooting in Uganda and also an amazing experience, really moving, continued to do a couple more projects. I went to Chernobyl um, for sort of an aftermath story. And that was fascinating. I traveled all around Ukraine and uh, Belarus and went to some hospitals, did a lot of kind of more photojournalistic projects there. But, um, but you know, ultimately, I, I don't think I was wired for that. And I found that I just kept on coming back to weddings, that I really was more connected to this um, the sort of notion of legacy, heirloom, those were things that I had always been drawn to. I loved making photo albums when I was little. And I and I think I just kept on coming back to that. So the wedding were for me. Yeah. So you, you've been shooting longer than I have. And I'm curious if you feel like when you were first, you know, at NYU, maybe wedding photography wasn't even perceived as something as a thing. Like now I feel like wedding photography is a thing, you know, such a bigger part. Like there are more people, you're sharing more images online, like just with this in, you know, influx of sharing images, wedding photography, I feel like kind of went from whatever to kind of like, this is really important. Have you seen during the course of your career, like more bookings, more profit, like what have you seen as, as you, as people decide to choose you? Are they taking more time about who they choose? Is it a more deliberate decision? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the weddings that I shoot now are so different than the ones that I shot at the beginning of my career. So, um, so I did that study abroad in Italy and then, then I ended up, I graduated, did the photojournalistic thing. And then I ended up moving back to Italy. I wanted to find a way to combine wedding photography with um, Italian language, which I'd studied in school. Um, So I ended up moving back there and I was pretty much the only photographer in Tuscany offering this somewhat newly developing American style of wedding photography, where it was a little more editorial, it was a little more fashion, not so photojournalistic. Um, There really just wasn't anybody else there, or if if there were other photographers, it was few and far between. So I was finding it very easy to book work in that niche because you know, there just was not any competition. I mean, now there are so many photographers in Italy. There's so many photographers in the South of France that I'm sure I would regularly compete with those people because, I mean, it makes sense for them to, you know, when possible, hire 
a local option. Um, so it, it's definitely different in terms of the bookings that I'm getting. But at the same time, I mean, I was shooting 35 weddings a summer in Italy, nonstop weddings, but these were very small. They were often um, a lot of British couples, American couples coming over, having 30 person destination weddings. They just weren't the um, the caliber of wedding that I'm shooting now. So I think it's a much different booking process. I did find those very easy to book. I, I never really spoke with the couples. It was always through a wedding planner or um, through a venue, but they would see my work and that would really speak for itself. Um, now the process is so much different, but um, but I think it's heavily relying on your portfolio to speak to those clients. I mean, people yeah. are, they're so much more visually focused now and they have so many options. So, yeah. um, so it's really, it's really up to them, you know, because I'm putting out there what, what I feel best represents my style and my work and this kind of aesthetic reality that I'm trying to create, but it's really, it's then in the hands of the client, you know, mm -hmm. as to whether or not they connect to that. And that's what I'm really after are those brides and those grooms that see something in my work and they say to themselves, I have to have that. I want to see myself in those photographs and they really love my interpretation of, of the day that way. So I think people would be curious to know, mostly I'm curious to know, do you remember like your first package offerings? I know you do all custom now. Do you remember like what price point you were at? Were you at like yeah. dollars or? I think I was probably at a, I think it was maybe around like $1,800, maybe somewhere in that range. I mean, admittedly, I, I had a frame of reference from working for that photography studio. So I, I mean, I'm sure that at some point I did do a $50 portrait for someone, but I didn't start with, you know, kind of like the Craigslist wedding. I always was connected to a studio. So I did have a sense of, and I actually, um, I should say too, that that studio, um, we shot all film. So I had a sense of the cost of that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was still expensive to shoot back then. So, um, so that was all kind of built into it, but certainly having that experience gave me a real understanding of the business side of it and how you needed to build in, um, those expenses and those prices. But yeah, I want to say I was probably, it was cheap, you know, <laughs> it was probably, uh, around $1,800, something like that. Mm, yeah. I'm curious, like, you know, when I was shooting, I was kind of around, I had been shooting for like three years. I was around 3,500. And then I booked this one killer wedding in, it was an LA couple coming to park city, mm -hmm. all the things you can dream of having happen, like the most incredible, um, rehearsal dinner that then got a six page spread in a magazine. Uh, and the bride and groom were just like models and her dress yeah. and her, and I charged him seven for that. And once I had that wedding in my portfolio, it like shifted yeah. what I could charge. Did you have a moment like that? Several where you were like just going along and then you booked something and it brought a lot of attention yeah. to you or anything like that, or just like I'm a wedding planner you met? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think back to, I mean, 19 years of photographing weddings. It's, uh, you know, you have to dig pretty far back. Well, do you to, feel like you those, just but... keep reinventing yourself or do you feel like just maintaining the relationships you met with yeah. wedding planners has been your, your bread and butter? Yeah. I mean, I would say a significant moment, um, in my, in my career coming back to the States. So, you know, I shot a, I was very successful with the weddings in Italy booking mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but I kind of burnt out on being there and I did want to move back to the States. So when I came back to the States, you know, I thought like I've been in Italy, I've got this amazing Tuscany portfolio. I had shot, um, by the time I left there, I was shooting not necessarily high budget weddings, but for me, they were, you know, we, I was nearing the, you know, more of the four to $5,000 range. And I was like in my early twenties. So that felt great to me. Yeah. Um, but, but when I got back, it was like nothing. I couldn't find a wedding planner to hire me. I mm -hmm. moved to Charleston, South Carolina. I, um, 
had CC New York, who I was doing some photography for, um, do these like beautiful little bespoke packages for me. And I would send out these little books. I think I had picked and maybe targeted 10 or 15 people in the area that I wanted to work for. And I, I got I want maybe three replies. And it was just so defeating because I thought, you know, I'm back here. I'm trying to make a life for myself and I'm never going to work. So I had to rethink that approach. And I ended up thinking, okay, so where can I work in the States that looks like Italy, but it's in the States. And so how can I get my portfolio out there to people who would that kind of style would resonate with. So I just said, California, yeah. I'm going to shoot in California. And I sent out, um, you know, some promos, some little handwritten notes to planners out in California. And that really worked. And in particular, I met Rebecca Stone with Duet Weddings so many years ago, and we just really hit it off. We did a photo shoot together just as an opportunity to kind of collaborate on something creative. It was before, it really was maybe at the beginning of blogs, but not when, um, you know, not when there were a ton of avenues to publish things like that, but we just did this shoot together and it really came together so well, it took off. It was everywhere. It was in, you know, it was on Style Me Pretty in the days of that being just one day, one yeah. post. And it really went so far. Um, it, it ended up being on the cover of Elle Decor. It was picked up as wow. a stock photo. It was just such a great opportunity, but that really launched my career. I felt like back in the States because especially with Style Me Pretty, you know, brides were looking at that website and then they were booking you immediately. They were just yes. sort of emailing. I mean, those were the days, weren't it they? It felt like the golden era. Yes. And they were just emailing you and like saying, yes, like done. What is your package? I want you. And I mean, it was so amazing. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely really launched my career. And then once I built a portfolio and I got more and more weddings in the States, then booking them in Charleston just came pretty easily, especially once I started getting more and more press. I think planners, you know, started to say, oh, she's local, you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's work with her. She can get us published. And so really did helped. you submit all the press or did the planner, like, were you the one, how did El Decor find you? Did you submit to them? Did they you know, see it? They, they just saw it. They okay. saw it. And then, um, it was, uh, it was a European version of the magazine and they must have just a photo researcher, I'm sure just saw it and they reached out. So it was um, a stock photo that, that basically was purchased. But, um, but otherwise I was submitting, you know, I was submitting to One Sweat or Style Me Pretty. Um, and I found those sites to be really useful in booking work. Do you feel like now your reputation is so secure, it's okay that you don't have these as many press options or have you found new press options that are giving you just as good of return? I mean, I think I definitely ride on reputation. Um, yeah. and I, and I do recognize that that must be challenging for newer photographers who don't have the same press opportunities, um, you know, that as there used to be, I think that, probably most important was the connection to Martha Stewart weddings. I think okay. that, um, I think that having so many regular editorial features in that magazine just really solidified my reputation within, in, within the industry that my work was publishable. I knew exactly what sort of shots were required on a wedding day to put together a really cohesive editorial spread. Um, and you know, it's not to say that it's impossible, but the formula is much different now. So, you know, places like Vogue.com or Harper's or The Knot. Um, and, and I mean, I, I do think that Martha's shifted a little bit as well. Um, you know, they just have different needs than than maybe what we were posting or sharing, you know, eight years ago. Um, so that's that's changed a bit. 
I have so many questions for you. Oh my gosh, this interview is going to be two hours long. Just kidding. I won't that long. Okay. Well, when you said, I just knew what shots to take, are those st- shots still the same? And could you name a few of those for us? Yeah, I do feel like they are the same in terms of the editorial moments. So, you know, you definitely want an establishing shot of the couple. And I tend to say that with most of the editorials, it's not going to be your most artistic photograph of the couple. It's more a photograph that says, here they are. This is what they wore. You know, maybe it's a little hint at the setting, but, um, you know, I, I'm sure we've all been there where we've submitted 150 photographs and the seven that are selected, you know, you think to yourself, oh, you know, <laughs> was that really the best portrait option? Like, did, did I even mean to put that shot in there? But really, you know, from their point of view, they're trying to show full length of the dress, mm-hmm. you know, maybe the suit, that sort of thing. So absolutely portrait. Then there are small editorial details like um, signature drink, escort card, welcome gift, invitation suite. Um Probably not the dress hanging up, probably not the shoes, unless it was, you know, something killer to the design. Um, There's a tabletop shot, but probably not a super wide shot of the table. It's, Mm -hmm. it's probably a little more close to, um, you know, to just give a, basically they want you to open the magazine and completely understand what that wedding was in, you know, a three second scan of the page. So um, My whole relationship to publication changed when I stopped just submitting images in chronological order. I did that right. for like the first year and then I right. caught on and was like, actually, if I can show them in 30 seconds exactly. that I have the 15 shots that they need yeah. and, I, and I would research each blog and look at exactly the formula that they would lay out and I would yeah. lay out my submission exactly like that. And then I started getting published like crazy. Yeah. They yeah. Just and just want to see that they have it. Exactly. And that's exactly how I would submit as well. And that's how I would encourage people to submit nowadays. You know, editors need to see, I mean, even in the email, I would put, you know, 10 very, you know, low res preview shots of the wedding because I wanted them to look at those shots and say, and think, yes, this, we can publish this. Um, So I definitely take the same approach. Um, You know, I also think it's, it's really key with editorial images and when you're building that potential spread that the photographs, you don't want every photograph to be, you know, a highly styled moment. You need, you need some images that give you a moment to breathe and you need some images that aren't, um, you know, a pattern background or a lace veil behind something that are just a solid and just simple. Um, So I really encourage photographers to let their editorial moments really be kind of quiet moments and let the content of the wedding, like the first dance or the ceremony, the kiss, those things can be um, more detailed. They can have more going on in the frame, but the the style details really don't have to. Mm -hmm. So that, I want to bring you back to Flatley's then, and you do such stunning work. Have you always done flat lays? Did you start the trend of flat lays? When did flat lays? I don't know. (laughs) How how did you decide? Because I look at yours and I remember I shot with you once in Italy and your contacts had the grid and you had a tripod and you, and I always have just stood over mine and I was like, oh my gosh, she has a tripod and she's putting it in the grid and this is so incredible. And oh my goodness, Ah. like... (laughs) How did you decide that this was going to be your thing? Do you enjoy doing it? Do you take your time and do it at home? I think you said that sometimes the invite you just do at home because you want to be pretty exact with it. Yeah. Tell us more. Yes, I do enjoy doing the, doing them. Um, they are so second nature to me now that, I mean, I think my second shooters are surprised when I take the bridal details. And I mean, it's all of... I don't know, 45 seconds for me to style something up because I, I have an idea. It's not, you know, it's not like it's a formula for the composition, but I know how I want things to move around a frame. So for example, you know, maybe with bridal accessories, I want that to feel sort of circular because it, you know, there's a ring involved, there's bracelets that have kind of a circular movement. So, um, so I kind of move in, in different shapes with invitations. Um, 
you know, I used to be very straight and rigid about them, but now I think I am a little looser with mm-hmm. invitation shots. But yes, I am a technician all the way when it comes to my flat lays. Everything is shot on a tripod. Everything is leveled out. Um, I really think that that actually simplifies the process when you can move your your sets, so to speak, mm-hmm. in and out of a, a static frame. Um, you know, I... I understand there is some ease to just kind of doing this over the camera, but for me, I need to be able to look in the camera, recompose, look in Mm -hmm. the camera, move that pedal that's, um, you know, out of place, that type of thing. So it's just, it's been years of perfecting. I am very obsessed with them looking absolutely perfect. And um, I think that, that level of perfection in my work has, has remained. And there have been other things that I've had to let go of or become looser with. And, and really, I think that that's important. That has been important to my work to not bring the same level of detail and perfection into my portraits, because I think that they need more spontaneity. They need more soul to them. But, um, you know, the, the style details, I'm not pulling soul out of an invitation shot. I just want it to be pretty. <laughs> just want um, it to look visually compelling. Do you have yeah. rules about like, do you ever crop things off frame or do you like everything to have a border around? I know you shoot contact 645. Is that right? Or are you still I shooting that? I don't or? actually. I shoot, you with, shoot? I shoot with a Pentax. The Pentax. Okay. I do. What um, Pentax? Yeah. I shoot with a Pentax 645 in. Um, now, have you transitioned? Were you contacts before? I have always had a contacts, but, um, and prop, maybe when I did the wedding with you. Um, I think you did, because I, I remember then? when you picked, I because we're in yeah. a Amazon film group, yeah. and you got the 645 in. Is that a digital camera? No. So I, for a period, I did have the, the Pentax 645Z, which was okay. a digital camera. I'm not using that for my digital so much anymore. But um, yeah, you know, the Contax, I think, is a beautiful camera. But I don't find my work to be, you know, I wouldn't say I'm in the whole creamy, dreamy camp. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I linger at F4 most of the time. Mm. I'm very um, focused on sharpness that that that's a real I think that that's important to my work I don't do a lot of motion blur I and I found the contacts to just be a little bit challenging um with certain technical elements like film flatness was always an issue um you know getting group shots back where half the wedding party was out of focus and it's so true um, (laughs) it's so it was just too frustrating to me and I found that um you know, my work doesn't require the um, the bouquet of the, the Zeiss lens at F2 because I just was never shooting it mm-hmm. at that. Um, yeah, so Pentax, it's, I have like eight of them. I, I just cycle through them. They, they're so cheap and they're just workhorse cameras. Um, and I do like the 105 for the Pentax. It has sort of a similar look um, to oh, the nice. Contax 80. So do you shoot Pentax and then what's your digital setup? Do you, you yeah. do both throughout the day, right? I do. Yeah. I am definitely a true hybrid photographer. Um, I, and always have been, you know, I, I don't think that marketing myself as a film photographer has really ever been the focus. It's much mm-hmm. more about just, this is the vision that I bring to the wedding day. This is my style, but I'm really trying to make my, digital work and my film work seamless. And I don't find that most of my clients are noticing a significant difference between yeah. the two. So I shoot Sony. Um, yay, Sony. I'm a big fan of yay, theirs. I'm not happy to have my first Sony. Well, I'm happy to hook anybody up with a good Sony connection because they've just been so great to me. And, um, really just walked me through that process of, I was previously Canon, but um, but the Sony really works for me, and um, and I love the look of it. There's some beautiful Zeiss lenses that work on a Sony, and um, so that's really what we've been using for, I guess, the past couple years now. Awesome. I love that. Yeah, I'm totally hybrid. We're both going to be at Hybrid Collective. I never market myself as like full film or anything. Yeah. I find 
beauty in both of them. And I loved when I got to shadow you at a wedding day. I mean, I wasn't just shadowing, I was shooting for you, but like, I just loved watching the way you switched out. You knew exactly where to use it. Um, You're also really, really uh, chill on a wedding day, which I tend to be too. And I really loved that because I have worked in some stressful situations where people can become like crazy people (laughs) on a wedding day. I wonder if my team would find that to be uh, (laughs) accurate. Um, I think that my wedding day anxiety sort of starts before breakfast and everybody knows that, and it usually is thinking through the timeline and I'm, and I'm thinking we don't have enough time for what I want to do. So I'm, and this is happening, you know, when we've, all ordered breakfast. So everybody on the team is experiencing this anxiety unfold. And I'm sort of saying, uh, I, I don't think we can leave at 11 anymore. I need to leave at 945. I, you guys finish your breakfast. I have to go. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in this kind of mode of, I just need to get there and get my hands on this and get going. And then I, I think I start to relax once I'm kind of when, once I'm there, I'm in a groove, um, but it's usually a bit of pre-wedding day or pre-wedding you know, wedding morning anxiety, just because I'm still you know, very invested in yeah. a level of perfection <laughs> for my clients. But um, you know, I really take what I do very seriously in terms of the legacy that I'm, that I'm producing for these clients. And, and that's truly meaningful to me. So I think I feel a certain amount of pressure to deliver because I know that these are photographs that it's not just delivering, you know, perfect editorial details that will make for a great spread in Martha Stewart. Um, I'm really thrilled that my work garners that type of support from editors, but it's not at this point in my career, the reason why I still am doing what I do and why I'm still loving shooting weddings. It's, it's really kind of an added bonus of, of the work at this point. Well, you really gave me permission because I shot with you in Lake Como and we did end up leaving an hour and 30 minutes earlier than we had planned. I remember you were like, I just have to get there. And I thought, okay, I'm coming. And you're like, you don't have to come. I'm like, no, I'm coming. (laughs) We went and, and you said, you know, usually Darcy, I just show up so early. And I thought before I thought if I showed up early, it would stress the client out or I was doing a disservice to my timeline because my packages were hourly, right? At that time, I don't do hourly anymore, really. And I thought, I can't show up early. They're going to not respect the package I gave them or they're going to think I'm working for free or all these things. And you were just like, nope, I show up early. And since then, literally, because I am a perfectionist too, I have been early to pretty much every wedding I've shot since then. I just show up early. I'm like, hi, I just want to be here and like get the lay of the land, start working. And it's never been, and people just are like, oh my gosh, great. You're here. And, and I just have to look over everything again, even if I've looked at it before. And, um, it's been a practice that I've brought into my shooting for sure. Well, and I think, um, certainly I have had photographers say to me, well, my package is eight hours, you know, so I, how do, what do you do if you don't have time in eight hours to, um, shoot those detail shots? And I mean, the way I look at it, you know, when photographing details early, that time is for me, that's Mm -hmm. not for the client. It's because I don't want to feel really rushed through something that I enjoy photographing. And I just, want some time to kind of figure out the shot. Um, you know, I want, I want to just be able to live with it a little bit and and make sure that I'm not racing, but I don't think that that should really go against the time that the client has hired me for, because when I'm hired, you know, it's been a long time since I've shot an eight hour wedding, but you know, let's say if I'm hired for eight hours, you know, I don't think 45 minutes of that eight hours should be spent photographing a welcome basket if that's what I want to spend, you know, 45 (laughs) minutes on, I think I've got to, I think I've got to do that on my own time. Now with that said, you know, if a client says we've decided we want to have the after party photographed, or we've decided we want to add in this extra time, then absolutely. Like anybody should, I charge overtime for that. And, um, 
you know, for the most part, I mean, at times, you know, it will have an agreement with a planner that's, you know, we're in a 10 to 12 hour range and and that's fine. And I feel comfortable with that. But if there are events that are added on, you know, absolutely. You should charge for your time. um, And I encourage that, but certainly with the editorial details, you know, I, I learned from shooting for Martha when they would hire me to shoot weddings. I mean, we would do full editorial shooting days the day before the wedding. And I, and I learned so much from that. And, mm-hmm. But it takes a lot of time. It definitely does to get all those angles right. It's true. You got to put in that time to get that portfolio. So I'm going to ask you a question that everybody's longing to hear the answer <laughs> to. What was your life like after you photographed Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner's wedding? Oh did my the, goodness. Did people just bang on your door? Did people DM you? I mean, that photo you posted was so glorious. I don't know if you're allowed to share any more of those, but at least they let you Yes, you shot it because I know you <laughs> shot a lot of celebrity weddings that won't let you say that sure, you shot that. Sure, sure. You know, that was a wonderful experience. I really love those two. I mean, I say that and we've it done, so uh, you know, we've gorgeous. done a good number of celebrity weddings, um, but they are delightful. So I think I was on such a high from that day and that, well, that five days of shooting of okay. just how wonderful these people were and how much I loved them as a couple and just the inner energy that they had around them. I so enjoyed, um, you know, of course that was a challenging wedding for my team. It was a heat wave of 108 degrees in the South of France. Oh my um, gosh, you know, and I remember. It, it was really hot. Um, there every day, you know, was a 16 hour plus day. It was definitely a challenge, but what I will say for that wedding was I, I would like to believe, and I think that they would agree with me that it was very empowering for my team. We Mm -hmm. really felt that we were in it together. And, um, and I think I I really love that, you know, of course that's, Monday, oh my gosh, I was absolutely exhausted. I think I cried a couple times in the car, <laughs> but uh, you know, we were trying to figure out that um, that image and get that ready for press. And, and th- as there always is, there was some back and forth um, with the photographs. So, do you like submit like ten to them, and then they yeah. choose where the press chooses? Or? Yeah. So normally, with a celebrity client, I would try and turn around a handful of photographs as soon as possible. So um, if there are plans to publish, or even if there aren't, I still like to give them some options just in case they change their mind. And in this case, um, you know, they did decide to use an image and, um, and that was really great. I don't think that there are any plans to release any more photographs, but, you know, ultimately I found that that didn't really matter because just having the one out there and just having my name attached to that um, was really all that I needed. People didn't need to see a photograph of the cake. They just needed to know that I shot it. And, um, and absolutely. I, I certainly wrote a little bit of a um, high train from uh, that wedding for a while. And I've certainly seen it as, you know, a nice experience, cert- always validating, um, but yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, they, they really are lovely people and that's what makes it so wonderful. Yeah. Um, when you have that type of experience where you can say, we worked really hard. This was a really over the top kind of intense, but wonderful experience, but we did it for two, you know, for a bride and groom that we just totally were in love with. So it, it was that's really awesome. it was fantastic. Well, the image was beautiful. Do you oh, feel like yeah. planners that you didn't know before reached out to you after that and just yeah. wanted to make that connection? Cause that really is a sign of trust. I mean, we, yeah, when well-known people who are so in the public eye get photographed all the time, end up choosing you to photograph them. That's like this validation of she is yeah. an authority and you can trust her and she is reliable and her images are gorgeous. So I would assume a lot of people reached out to you after that. To yeah, book. I do think that I was um, I was getting inquiries from planners that I hadn't heard of before or I hadn't worked with before. Um, certainly some other locations that I didn't previously get inquiries for. So there was a good, you know, influx of Provence wedding inquiries. Um But this season, I'm definitely working with some new planners, and that's really exciting to me. 
just because I think it's nice to mix it up, see how different teams produce weddings. I think it always helps me to better prepare for my own events, even with the planners that I work with regularly who are tried and true. You know, I think that it's, it's helpful to just see different ways that events unfold and really be prepared for anything and everything. So, yeah. Um, so it's been great. So I'm going to turn the tables and we'll wrap our, our interview up. One of my favorite weddings of all time that I look at again and again and think if my soul could plan a wedding, it would be this one (laughs) is your wedding. I feel like people still look at that again. Do you still get people talking about your wedding? You had a photographer, Elizabeth Messina, right? Yeah. Shot your wedding. Yeah. How did you decide Elizabeth? Were you two just friends and you knew it was to be her? Like how does someone like you <laughs> who's a photographer and plan a wedding? What was that like? You know, I, it was so much about connection to someone's work. I didn't actually know Elizabeth, although, um, you know, I certainly got to know her well through the process, but I just loved her photographs. Um, I had a very, small short list of photographers that I reached out to, but, um, but she and I had a conversation on the phone and I really connected to her personality and, um, and I could tell that she would know how to make me feel my most beautiful and feminine on a wedding day. So I think that that was really what, what I was after was not so, you know, the work spoke for itself. I knew her, her photographs were just so beautiful and moving, but, um, but I also wanted a level of support and comfort throughout that experience. So that's really, really what I found through her. And I mean, I love that the wedding still is, you know, inspiring to people. And I was actually, I was packing some stuff up for hybrid, um, and pulling a couple of bits and bobs that I have from my own wedding that, you know, I might incorporate into the shoot, but, um, did you two like pre-plan because I loved so many of the details you had like a teapot with like sugar and you had the boot yeah. ears and you had, it was in Ireland, I believe. So you had like these yeah. little four leaf clover chart. You can tell I'm obsessed yes. with writing it and everything <laughs> about it. Did you guys pre-plan each of those shots? Um, and like, were you involved in that or did you just let Elizabeth do her thing? Or yeah, kind of I, forth? I pretty much, I mean, absolutely trusted Elizabeth to just do her thing on the wedding day and, and really throughout the whole weekend. I mean, she's such a talented and gifted stylist and, um, and photographer that there was never, I, I didn't, ever pick up my camera, um, on the wedding day or really that weekend. And and that's a real testament to just how wonderful her work is because I I never felt any need, um, you know, to be a secondary documentarian to that experience. I just wanted to be in it. And, um, you know, I just, I really wanted to feel the, the wedding as a bride and not as a photographer, but, um, and it wasn't pre-slated for Martha, although, um, I certainly had high hopes for really for the vendors because everybody just puts so much love and soul into their role on the wedding day that I hoped for their sake that, that something would come of it. Um, so I had a shot list, you know, had, had given just ideas of, of what would be available in terms of the different styling elements and the different details. But, um, but yeah, Elizabeth kind of ran with it. I just had everything ready for her and, um, she shot quite a bit the day before and, um, and the day of, of course, too. Mm. It's so beautiful. You both looked beautiful. It was such an intimate moment. I love the picture of Thatcher taking a picture of you. I do too. I just think that is just glorious. Well, you are just such a wealth of knowledge. I remember when I worked with you in Italy, I had so many questions. I was just starting and you were one of the most generous, giving, no competitive spirit, no worry (laughs) that any, you know, you just gave to me, you answered every question. I'm sure you were like, Darcy, please let me just- No, I love it. uh, (laughs) No. But I remember every dinner, I was just like, Corbin, can I ask you this? Can I ask you this? And I was taking notes and taking notes and you were so- You've just been in this industry for so long. You have such a beautiful reputation. You have such a beautiful talent. Anybody would be so lucky to work from you, learn from you, work with you. I'm so excited you're doing hybrid so people can have a little bit more access to you because I think we just see this beautiful life that you live and you just have this artistic soul and you let that pour through in your life and in your work. And 
you've just shared so generously on this phone, on this blog. What are we doing? Well, I'm so proud of all that you're doing. I'm just blown away by you. And I, I do think back to that trip to Italy and, but I love it. You are just doing it. And I think it's so wonderful. And look, you know, I think it really is about sharing the experience and, um, and I am an open book because honestly, you know, I, I probably get the most questions about what camera is this or um, what preset is this or, and I totally understand a desire to know those things, but I can guarantee you that I can give you a complete list of all the things that I use and we're still never going to make the same images. And I think that that's actually what's so wonderful about photography and about wedding photography is that we're each coming to this with our own point of view and our, our own, you know, vision for our photographs. And um, that's what makes it exciting. It's not anything to, you know, feel badly about or feel jealous about. It's really, um, it's really encouraging that we can all, you know, approach a day that's relatively similar um, in our own unique way. So I really want to encourage everybody to do that. And, um, you know, I'm happy to, anybody can ask me anything. I'm really happy to help anytime. The DMs are going to start coming. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for being a guest oh, today. My we pleasure. are so lucky to hear from all of this wisdom. Thank you, Darcy. It's a pleasure. You've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief. Then don't keep us a secret. If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave.